Jesus, we love you. We come before you together as a body of believers, setting our eyes on you, on our holy God, fully sovereign, fully in control. And we lift our eyes together as a family. We lift our hearts to you this morning. Come and make much of this worship. Come and rest in the praises of your people. We invite you, Holy Spirit. We invite you, Holy Spirit. To the one who's seated on the throne above all kings. To the one who saw it fit to gather all his children close. To the one I feel when the sunlight's on my skin. To the one who shattered every remnant of my sin. To the
children. And we see our broken world. We see all that's around us. And we take courage, but we cry out. We cry out on behalf of injustice. We cry out on behalf of all the wrongs. We say, let heaven come on earth as it is in heaven. Great rescuer, come and rescue. split the sky and you will make all things right. And together corporately as your bride, we say come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, that we can still come together in public and sing and praise and worship aloud. Thank you, Father, that we have that privilege set before us, Lord and that no man can take it from us. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of worshiping you as a congregation, coming together in one heart and one accord, unified in our purposes, in our pursuit, in our focus. Thank you that you're coming back, that you really are coming back. Help us prepare for your return. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can have a seat. If you have an offering, a tithe, an offering, we have a table set up in the back here that you can go and fill out an offering envelope and leave it in one of those buckets back there. We're not passing the buckets around right now because of, um, uh, yeah, one of those reasons, everything. So, But feel free to go back. Anytime during the service, uh, we ask that you take care of it before, before the service is over with. Whether you voted for him or not, our governor has moved to have something that I believe is an answer to prayer. I know it's an answer to my prayers. That tomorrow, Tuesday, and Wednesday at noon, we're having fasting and prayer statewide for the coronavirus. Now, this is significant. Let's lay in politics aside. Whether you voted for him or not, it really makes no difference. This is significant. Because I really believe that as a state of Louisiana, not just the churches, but the whole state comes together and lays aside one hour. Can you not pray with me one hour? One hour. Monday, tomorrow, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and fast. Some of us can use that. And I said us. And I believe that it will have a tremendous effect on the effects of coronavirus in this state. I really believe that. I do. Because the Word says, if my people will humble themselves, call upon my name, seek my face, pray, and turn for the wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins, and I'll heal their land. So I invite you. To enter into this next three days, you want to fast more than uh, noon uh, lunch, knock yourself out. Go for it. You know, he, thank God he didn't ask for all three days. But he just said the noon meal on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Now, we're opening the church up from 11 to 1 on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday for you to come in and pray during that time. Don't have to come here. I just know that we pray better at church than we do at home. At noontime, anyway, when the fridge is calling our name. But the church is going to be open from 11 to 1, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday for prayer. You, you can come for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or a whole hour, whatever you want to do during that time. But it's going to be open, okay? Then, of course, Tuesday we have our prayer room from 12 to 1. Thursday we have our prayer room from 12 to 1 at the same time, okay? All righty. Thank you for viewing us by Facebook. We look forward to seeing your comments show up on the on the screen. So, Aaron, come bless us. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Are you ready? Because I am. I am ready. I am ready. The Lord has deposited this word inside of me, and I am just I'm busting at the seams. I can't wait to share it with you uh, this morning. I, I believe that it is on the spirit of God's mind. 
to talk about this subject this morning called Ministry to the Lord. Everybody say, Ministry Ministry. to the Lord. To the Lord. Well, isn't all things that I do ministry to the Lord? Yes. Yes. But what I'm going to be talking about is the way your heart, my heart, is postured before the Lord when we're alone with Jesus. So I'm going to say that again. When I say ministry to the Lord, I am talking specifically about the way your heart, the way my heart, is postured when there's nobody else in the room but Jesus. How does my heart look at him? Whenever there's no one around watching to make sure I'm doing it. What's going on in my mind? What kind of warfare is going on in my mind whenever I'm trying to sit in that room by myself and just think about the Lord? What kind of traffic starts to enter my mind? I want to talk about one of the most precious ministries that we have been given. One of the most precious ones we have been given is this thing called ministry to the Lord. And we're going to just unpack that. I'm hopefully going to do that within this time frame. So would you pray with me? Would you pray with me this morning? I, I just, I'm so thankful for the presence of the Lord, but I just want to ask him to increase specifically on our hearts for revelation. Lord, would you come and open the eyes of our hearts this morning? I'm asking you, Spirit of God, come and open up the eyes of our understanding that we would see the text rightly. I'm asking that we would be overcome by the glory of Jesus today, that this was not a social club gathering, but a place of encounter with Jesus this morning. I'm asking Holy Spirit, come and mark us for eternity today. Come and mark us with the glory and the beauty of Jesus, that our lips would proclaim who we truly believe him to be. I'm asking God, would you set a people apart to minister to you wholeheartedly with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength? God, I'm asking, come and set us apart with the fire of your spirit this morning. Come and mark us, God. Change us. And it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. You know, as I was meditating the last couple of weeks, just on the Lord, this phrase just broke into my heart as I was praying in the Spirit. And the phrase was this, it's always the right season to break open praise. I'm going to say that again, because repetition is your friend except for sin and snickers. The Holy Spirit was very clear to me the, uh, the, the last couple of weeks, and it's never left me. It is always the right season to break open praise. Regardless of the season that I'm walking through, regardless of the pandemic, regardless of the opportunities that are my way or not, whether things are working for me or not working for me, I'm here to say it is always the right season to break open praise before the Lord. And I'm going to talk very specifically about a costly praise this morning because I believe we can enter into a thing called surfacey praise where we just say all the right things, but we're not actually talking to a real person. I'm talking about reaching in the depths of who we are and who he's planted on the inside of us and pulling out a costly praise like we'll see that Mary of Bethany does in John chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles with you, paper, digital, open those up to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I believe ministry to the Lord is one of the most misunderstood things. The one of the most argued things within Christianity, and this is why I say that. We're constantly saying, well, shouldn't I just be doing a bunch of good things for people? What's the point in sitting in a room and talking to a person that I can't see? Shouldn't I be doing something? Shouldn't I be serving the poor? Shouldn't I be rescuing this person or doing that person? And I get caught in this perpetual busyness and I begin to look at ministry of the Lord and go, "Eh, I can do better things with my time. I can do better things with my time and my affections. Jesus wants me to be this active superhero in the earth. He wants me to work to the bone. And we'll hear this trumpeted from different places, but Jesus is very clear when he said, what is the most important thing you could do with your life is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we're going to see in this passage that what Mary did, people called her out for it and said, you should have been using that for something else. You should have been more active with your hands. And Jesus says, no, no. And we'll look at that in a second. We'll see how Jesus, the great defender of Mary of Bethany, because he does it more than once for her. We'll see how he steps in and sets the record straight and sets forth a pattern of what it looks like to break open praise. So let's look at that this morning. My intention today is that we would understand the importance of the ministry to the Lord through devotional prayer and worship. And have this understanding fuel us to seize moments every day to pour out our love on Jesus. 
Today we're going to look at a powerful account of a young woman named Mary. Everybody say Mary. Mary. So this is not Jesus' mother, okay? Different Mary. Mary, this, is, this young woman had such a powerful testimony about herself, yet not, I mean, you look throughout church history, there were no great revivals named after her. There were no uh, great things written in the book of Acts about her, but in the storyline of Jesus, in his narrative of the gospel, she had a very significant role that she played. So here's a few things that we know about Mary. She was from a place called Bethany. Everybody say Bethany. Bethany. So that's the place she was from, Mary of Bethany. That's where she was from. So Bethany was this place that Jesus kind of frequented a few times, and he really loved this family. Like, they, they appear three times in his story, this family. So the, she has a sister named Martha. So Mary of Bethany has a sister named Martha, and she has a brother named Lazarus. So these are some of the things that we know, a little bio about our person that we're looking at this morning. We're going to observe how Jesus responds to the way Mary ministers to her. Now, there are three primary appearances. I alluded to that already, but I'm going to break down each one of those appearances for you. So the first appearance of Mary of Bethany in the storyline of Jesus is Luke chapter 10, verse 39. And this is a really cool passage because uh, Mary is doing something that we would go, you're wasting your time, Mary. You should be doing more things for Jesus. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Jesus is washing her with his word. He's talking and she's learning and sitting there of him. And her sister Martha, everybody say Martha. Martha, Martha who is not the villain in this story, okay? <laughs> Let's just clear that up because we go, shame on Martha. If Martha's not running the kitchen, nobody's eating. Think about that for a minute. But Martha, Martha was actually addressed by Jesus because of the way she was criticizing what Mary was doing. Not because of what Martha was doing, but because she was criticizing what Mary was doing. So Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning of him. He's, she's got her, her, her worship tapes on, her worship videos on, YouTube's up. And she's just, she's just letting the word and the presence of Jesus wash over her. Martha comes up and says, you should be doing something else. Jesus, tell her to get off of herself and get up and help me do this stuff. And Jesus says, no, she's actually chosen the good part. Martha, there's one thing necessary. There's one thing necessary, and what she has will never be taken away from her. So Jesus, the great defender, defends her in Luke chapter 10. We see in that first experience of Mary of Bethany in the storyline. So we have that first one. We find Mary at Jesus' feet, learning. So the second appearance is in John 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 32. And this is the neighboring chapter to our chapter 12 that we're in. Everybody say yes. Yes, that's how numbers work. 11 and then 12. And then so we have this chapter 11, verse 32. And so Mary, we once again find her in the storyline because Lazarus is seriously dead. Lazarus is her brother. Same Lazarus. Lazarus is seriously dead. And this young woman who sat at the feet of Jesus is now at his feet, falling in surrender, saying, where were you? You could have saved the day. He's gone now. But in, the, in this beautiful chapter, she actually finds Jesus to be the resurrection and the life. Not just the healer, but the resurrection and the life. The one who can take seriously dead people and make them fully alive yes. by simply calling their name forth. Amen. And so there is Mary of Bethany. Once again in our storyline, we find her at the feet of Jesus. Now the third appearance is the one we're going to be looking at today. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. And Mary once again finds herself at the feet of Jesus, doing something different. So we see, just in recap, we know Mary of Bethany to be a person of deep devotion, affection, and love for Jesus. For she was the one who sat at Jesus' feet and learned. Then she was the one who fell at Jesus' feet and surrendered. And finally, we'll find the same Mary honoring Jesus by anointing his feet with a costly oil. Magnificent, absolutely magnificent. Holy Spirit, would you open our eyes to see what you're saying in these texts today? Let's read that, verse 1. We're going to pick up at verse 1 and end at verse 8. Everybody say yes. yes. Great, okay. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead, was. There they made him a supper and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. 
But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not always have. Six days before the Passover, this is referred to as Passion Week. Six days before the Passover, Mary of Bethany, where Jesus is in Bethany, and we're told that a supper is prepared in honor of Jesus. And many believe that this supper was prepared to celebrate the fact that a seriously dead person came up from the grave, came out of the grave. And so the supper is this celebration. It's this celebration set. The table is set for Jesus. He is the main event in this whole thing. Then all of a sudden, in the middle of dinner, Mary comes on the scene and does something that is so extravagant. She begins to anoint Jesus with a very costly oil and dry his feet with her hair. Now, I'm going to tell you that this was really awkward. Some of us go, oh, yeah, she did that. That was really awkward. And I'm going to tell you why it was awkward, because we're going to talk about some cultural things that should have happened. So there are a few things that make this very interesting. One is that it was typical for guests to have their feet washed with water on the way in, and maybe have their head, forehead dabbed with a little bit of oil or perfume. So that's the first thing, culturally. It's like, okay, this has happened in the middle of the dinner. Also, the timing is really strange. The timing was culturally off from what would be considered an appropriate time. As I said, it's when the guests come in. Not in the middle of dinner. But Mary uses a costly oil to minister to Jesus, and we're told that this oil was expensive. Everybody say expensive. expensive. Cha-ching. And of great value. The sum cost of this oil would be a working man's salary, yearly salary. One of the figures that I saw was something like 25000 would be what that kind of, a working man's salary for the year was what that oil represented. I want to ask you a question just to think about this for a second. Do you think she planned this? Or did she just happen to stumble across a bottle of oil and break it at his feet? Just so happened to be the most expensive thing. Or did there, was there thought that went into what she did? Think about that for a minute. The oil she used was considered to be unadulterated oil or genuine, which made its value all the more precious. Mary uses her hair to dry his feet. This is also a little strange. Commentators note that this was not definitely not typical of a Jewish woman to do. They usually kept their hair up. But in this moment, she lets her hair down, and she begins to dry his feet with her hair, which was a sign of the great humility that she felt in that moment. Jesus already told his disciples about his impending death, but Mary seems to have really taken what Jesus said to heart. Mary seizes that moment to show the depth of her love and gratitude as though it would be the very last time she could display this kind of affection for her Lord. Mary seems to be free from worry about what others think. Mary seems to have one aim, to minister to the heart of Jesus in a profound, extravagant way. And I love this part of the verse. We're told that the fragrance of the oil filled the entire house. The depth of her devotion filled the whole room. You know, it's interesting how smells can capture memories. You ever smelled something and go, like, here's one. This one's kind of funny. But because I grew up in, in Cameron, we would smell pogey plants. And so if I smelled that, I would imagine I'd be on the playground again in elementary school. It, it, it's, a, it, it's like it rings a memory back. Can you imagine the whole room is filled, all of these people that are here for this dinner, or smelling the smell, seeing the sight, this would be a memory burned on them forever. And they think about the smell of that costly oil. It's the smell. What is the smell? It's the smell of a heart that is fully in love with Jesus and seizes the moment to fully express that love for Jesus. Now, the next thing that happens in the narrative is also really interesting, is that uh, she gets a little hater. Everybody know what a hater is? You don't have any. Okay. So, so she gets a hater in the crowd who happens to be Judas. Judas, and we all know what he will do, but at the time, none of the other guys knew what he was going to do. Everybody thought he was an upright standing citizen, you know? He's, he's, he's one of the 12. And so he criticizes Mary in that moment and starts to criticize her in the area of finances. And he says, 
you should have taken that oil, sold it, and gave the money to the poor. What a waste. Judas criticizes her about, taking her about the action and calls it irresponsible. He can't see the preciousness and the pureness of this divine moment that's taking place. Now, Judas obviously didn't see the significance of what Mary was doing as she was seizing the moment to minister to the lover of her soul. But Jesus, Mary of Bethany's great defender, once again steps in and defends Mary. Just like he did earlier against Martha. He defends Mary in front of Judas. Now, I think it's interesting that the man that would criticize her for money and saying the 25,000 should have been given to the poor would be the same one that would sell his Lord out for a thousand. He would be the same person that criticized in that moment about finances would be the very one that would sell the life of Jesus for a thousand. Amazing how a religious critical spirit works. Amazing. Jesus defends Mary and he tells them, hey guys, you don't understand something. I've been trying to tell you the whole time that I'm not going to be here much longer. But Mary's got it. Mary understands something. I'm going to physically not be here with you anymore. And this ability to pour out or break open this offering is not going to be a possibility much more in the physical nature. This moment, he's saying, this moment's about to pass all of you by, but Mary, the one who sat at my feet and heard my word, this one understood the moment she was in and seized it. She understood that this moment was an opportunity to not just be part of the meeting and blend in, but an opportunity to pour out the depths of her gratitude and affection upon Jesus. Mary indeed engaged in what I'm referring to as ministry to the Lord. How many of you know that it's really easy to just attend the meeting and blend in? All of these people were there to celebrate Jesus. They were there for the service. They were present. They were even sitting by him. But only one got it. Only one. And it was deeply connected to her ability to sit at his feet earlier. Her devotional life fueled this ability to break open a costly offering. It's clear that Jesus defends Mary in the story that we just read, and Jesus welcomes this form of extravagant love, gratitude, and devotion, and he actually encourages it. It's interesting that as humans, we completely can miss what's important to God. It's amazing. I do it all the time. I miss it. And Jesus paints this big target for us and says, "Here, right here, this is what's really important, and this is what you should spend your life doing. And this is what's really important to him. That to, it's really important to Jesus that we express love to him in the same way he expresses love to us. And this is what I mean. He loves us with his absolute all, and he asks us to return that. Love me with your absolute all. Love me with your absolute all. To further explain this, it's deeply connected to the first and greatest commandment. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. He's calling us to a wholehearted expression of gratitude, love, and thankfulness. And that's what we're seeing in this storyline of Mary of Bethany. The oil Mary poured out upon Jesus was an offering that represented her all. Say all. all. We also have an all. You have an all. I have an all. Yes. And I believe that Mary's ability to discern her all, listen to this, her ability to discern her all and be willing to break it at the feet of Jesus was deeply connected to the depth of her devotional life. Yes. Did you catch that? Yes. You have an all, but can you discern what the all is? Do you really know what the all is? Because we just talked about that a second ago. Do you think she just, oh, look at this bottle. I'll use this one. Did she do that? We're called to love God in the same way with this all. Do you know, in thinking about her devotional life and thinking about her being the one who sat at her, had his feet and let the word wash over her, she was also the one that saw his mighty power at work when Jesus raised her seriously dead brother from the grave. And now she was the only one at the special dinner for Jesus who was so overcome with the glory of God that she reached for the most expensive, costly thing in her house. Broke it open at his feet. And just like all of heaven does right now, said in so many words, only you are worthy. Yes. 
she reached for the most costly thing in her house. She ministered to Jesus with the most costly thing in her house. It represented her past, her present, her future. Her, her ability to succeed in life was wrapped up in this. And she said, that's it. That's the offering I will break at his feet and live with no regret inside about doing it. Right. I'm going to ask you this morning, what's that costly thing in your house? The way that we learn to discern what that costly thing is, is doing what she did in Luke chapter 10, sitting at his feet with the word of God open before us. Yeah. That is how we learn what our all is before him. Otherwise, it's a bunch of smushy, gushy feelings and not much more than that. See, what Mary was doing was called a response. And that is what the beauty and the glory of God does. He is so beautiful and radiant that it demands and provokes a response. And Mary was the only one in that crowd of people that was evoked, that response was evoked out of. It was deeply connected to her devotional life. And I want us to get this, because sometimes we get this and we go, okay, I'm going to feel really passionate in my worship now. Now I'm pouring oil. But Mary did something very planned, very intentional. She reached for that costly thing in her house and said, this is the only thing that I have that can even start to touch what you have done in my life, who you have been to me, and how you've made yourself known. This is the only thing. This is the only thing I can find. And so it's a picture of what we are also called to do in an extravagant way before the Lord and how we're supposed to live our lives before his eyes, that we would search and reach for that costly thing. I believe that she was caught up in what I'm going to call the worth of Jesus. She was caught up in the worth of Jesus. And I want to ask you, have you been caught up in the worth of Jesus lately? Because only a heart that's caught up in his worth can ex respond this extravagantly. I'm going to say that again. Only a heart that's caught up in the worth of Jesus can respond this extravagantly. The heart that's not caught up in his worth will respond like all the other guests at the party. They'll be there. They'll be at the service jumping up and down giving Jesus high fives. But the end result of a heart that's not caught up in worth is to be like one of these guests and even more so, the progression leads to being like Judas where we start to criticize others who are pouring their all before the Lord. So we see this progression, and this is where we need to know this. This is where our heart, my heart, your heart will end up if I'm dull inside and not cultivating a lifestyle of sitting at his feet and listening and hearing his word. And I'm talking about more than just hearing his word in a sermon. I'm talking about devouring this book. I'm talking about getting in a perpetual conversation about the worth of Jesus you're going, I can't sit at his feet physically, but he's giving us his word. Yes. This is how we do it, guys. Yes. It's not spooky dooky. That's my term. As I was sitting through looking at this and, and just asking the Lord questions and meditating, I was going, how have I been able to stay in a perpetual conversation about the worth of Jesus? I've opened this book, and, and guys, listen, and I've sung it. I've sung it, I've prayed it, I've read it out loud. I let the word and the worth of Jesus wash over my heart again and again and again because life tells me a lot of times that he's not worthy. Circumstances tell me that he's not worthy and then I end up on a progression of dullness on the inside, deadness on the inside, and I can't even begin to break open a, a pure, deep offering of worship anymore. I can't even begin to even know where the bottle is. The worth of Jesus is what illuminates the whole thing. It's what says, even this is a small offering that I break before your feet. Even this doesn't even measure to the cost or the worth of what you have done in my life. That is extravagant worship and praise. Yes, yes, yes. And that's what he's searching for inside of us. Not just from a few that love to sit in a prayer room. He's searching for that response from every single one that names themselves as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus Christ. He's saying, I have loved you with the whole content of who I am. And worship becomes that response. You love me that much. I love you that much back, God. My God, I want to get to the point. 
I always want to be at the point where I'm breaking open the bottle. But I'm looking and I'm seeing that my ability to break open the bottle is connected to how I'm sitting at his feet and letting his worth touch me again and again and again. I must have a real vibrant relationship with the word of God, with prayer in order to get here in order to value ministry to him like he says it is valuable. Because it is. He says it right there. He rebukes the guy that says you should have used your time for other stuff. Although that sounded noble to do, he rebukes him. He says, no, no. She's done something no one else in this room can see. She's responded in the way all of heaven is responding right now. I'm convinced that Jesus is worthy of a response from us. I believe he is just that beautiful. I know that all of heaven knows this reality today. They take one look at him around the throne and they completely collapse over. Crowns begin to be thrown down. Words begin to be evoked. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. There is a response happening as his beauty just begins to shoot out. That's what I imagine. It just shoots out. Wave of beauty. All of heaven just collapses over and says, no one is like you. That is the essence of worship. See, I think in culture we've gotten worship backwards. Worship is, oh, I felt tingles. Do that song again. I felt tingles that time. Worship was never about how I feel. Worship was about responding to worth. His worth. Whether I feel it or not. That's why the Holy Spirit spoke and he said, "Break." And it's always the right season to break open praise. It's always the right time to lift up that sound. Because day and night, night and day, it's happening around the throne. Ceaseless adoration for one who is worthy. I'm the one that needs to get up to speed. I... Humans, we need to get up to speed because we live under the sun and we get real confused real fast. He's worthy right now, but in two hours, I'm not sure because I had to wait a long time for my food. I'm not sure if he's worthy, y'all. But I'm telling you right now, listen to me. Listen to me. It's always the right season to break up in praise, but where is your life in this book? Are you eating this book? Are you just hoping to be a car one day because you're sitting in a garage? Well, I come to church. So that must be enough. I'm here to tell you that if church is not pointing you to this in your Monday through Saturday, then we're missing something. I'm sorry. I'm just going to say it. This is the destination. This is where I'm ending up, where I'm okay with sitting in a room whether by myself or with others in a prayer meeting, having the Bible open and just beginning to let the word of God wash over me so I can get caught up in a conversation about his worth so that I can break open the bottle, so that I can pour my affection on Jesus in the way that he's worthy of. I'm telling you, this is on the Lord's mind. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This will forever be at the forefront of his agenda. It's getting a people convinced that aren't confused when we say, hey, we have a prayer meeting going on. Well, why would I do that? For a people that would hear people begin to sing the word spontaneously over music and not be confused, scratching their heads, going, what are you doing right now? What they're doing is creating a conversation about his worth so that they can break open oil. That's what they're doing. That's what we're doing. And that's what we've been invited to, into this morning. Would you stand with me? I've been asking the Lord for the last few days, would you mark a generation with this? Would you set even a few people on fire with this reality? Would you go where no man can go, Holy Spirit of God, go deep into the deepest places and do what you did in Mary of Bethany, do to us? I'm asking him to get us caught up in his worth, deliver us from delusion and the spirit of the age, and begin to set us into a conversation about his worth. I'm asking for God to do a deep work on the inside of each and every one of us. But I want to know this morning, every eye closed this morning, every eye closed, I want to know this morning how many would say, God, mark me for this. I know as a house we have said, keep your hands up. I know as a house we have said, 
from the depths of our soul. We've written it on the walls that we want to be a place that champions this thing called ministry to the Lord. That champions this thing called staying steady before his face. That champions this thing called seeking him and lifting up holy hands in worship. We have said we want to be that place, but how many would say as an individual, I want to be that? I want to take responsibility. My God. Yo, just keep your hands lifted this morning. Just keep your hands lifted. There's something powerful taking place in hearts this morning. There is something, the Spirit of God is awakening something on the inside of you that has been dormant for a really long time. The Spirit of God is awakening something inside of you that's never even been awake yet. But you're about to feel the breath of God breathing on you this morning. Come, Holy Spirit. Ho! Oh. Ho, oh, come, Holy Spirit. I want you to repeat after me while your hands are lifted, eyes are closed. Catch me up in your worth, Jesus. Let me see you rightly. Let me respond to you rightly. I want to stand before you and minister to your heart and not think it a strange thing, but let it be natural that I do this thing with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. I want to respond to you like all of heaven does. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord, I thank you for opening our hearts this morning to see your worth. I thank you for opening our hearts to see your worth this morning. I'm telling you, I'm seeing dullness coming off, like shedding off of your hearts this morning. I'm seeing dull, stony, rocky places come and just begin to break off of your heart this morning. Because he's saying this heart, this place that's been encased with stone, was meant to be a heart that's tender to my presence. Holy Spirit, come and do a work. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. My challenge to you out of all of this, you can look at me now. My challenge to you in all of this is that this week, you begin to put your eyes on this in a new way. That you open up the book or your tablet or your phone and you begin to just talk to the Lord about these things, about his worth. Each day this week, that's my challenge. Maybe we'll call it the seven-day challenge. Let's call it the seven-day challenge. This is your seven-day challenge. Each day to get in this book and begin a conversation. Maybe some of you need to start singing it out loud. I don't play piano. YouTube has tons of things out there. Just, just open your phone, tell it to pull up some instrumental music, and just begin to go. But that's your challenge. Open this book, begin to make it a real dialogue, because I'm telling you, it's time to meet with a real person whenever we pray yeah. and when we worship. It's time to meet with a real person. Yeah. Not just whether I feel goosebumps or not. There's a real person longing to have a real conversation with me and you. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to pray a blessing over you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you walk in the favor and the blessing of the Lord in all that you do and all that you say. May your house be a place of blessing. May your home be a place of peace, of shalom, nothing missing and nothing broken. May your family experience the peace of God. May your employment experience the favor of God that's on your life, that everything that you touch every spreadsheet you touch, every wrench you turn, every uh, classroom you find yourself in, that they would experience the favor of God and say, surely the Lord shines on this one. 
And I thank you for doing that. Bless in the city, bless in the field, bless when you come and when you go. Surely he smiles on you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, we love you, and we pray you have an exceptional week, and we will see you next time.